Ready, go. How many of you heard of Great America? Theme park. I love Great America. I really do. My favorite ride there is called a drop zone. Um, if you don't know what a drop zone is, I'll give you a little picture of what it is. It's a tower. When you get on the drop zone, it'll take you all the way to the top. You'll sit up there for a couple seconds, maybe several. You might bounce a little, and then you just boom, you drop. And it's really cool because then your stomach somehow finds its way into your sternum. You know, like, what is that doing there? And uh, what about Magic Mountain? Six Flags Magic Mountain down in LA. That's my personal all time favorite theme park. I wore my um, Magic Mountain t shirt, Costa Rica. I love it so much. Um, I do have a favorite ride there as well. It's Lex Luthor. <laughs> the drop zone in Great America is 200 feet high. The one at Magic Mountain is this high. Four hundred and fifteen feet is how high Lux Luther is on Magic Mountain, and still holds to this day the world record of the tallest drop zone. What I really love about this ride is you get there, you get on it, and it takes a full ninety seconds for the whole ride to take place. So you're looking at a minute and a half of just pure fun and thrill and terror. And the best day to ride this thing is on a windy day. And the reason is because when you're up, let's say halfway or more, you know what the tower is doing on a windy day? It's swaying. So while you're in your seat all the way up there, you're feeling yourself do this kind of thing, and you can't see anything above you and below you. It looks like everyone is, is an ant. It's so tiny. And the better part, also on a windy day with that, this ride's connected to another ride. The Superman ride. It starts out all the way over here, it shoots, and it climbs up the tower. That's the Superman ride. So while we're up here on Lex Luthor, and the Superman ride goes, shoots up there and goes back down, it shakes the tower as well. So it adds even more swaying. So now you're not just doing this, you're kind of going all the way, almost arm's length of a sway. And you're just freaking out. It's totally awesome. We're sitting up there, Lex Luthor's giving a speech about how, thank you for volunteering for his death thing, whatever it may be. And you're waiting for it, and you're waiting for it, and all of a sudden you hear the click, 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 the clicking of the metal letting go, and you <laughs> and you're falling, okay? What's so cool about this is as you're falling, you're screaming, you're screaming, then you have to take a breath because it's so long of a drop, and you can't take a breath because your stomach is kind of sweat into your lungs, so you can't take your breath anymore, but you struggle to get air, and you start screaming again, and then you finally hit the bottom, and you're done. And then you'll get off the ride and you'll look up at that tower and you'll go, let's do that again. <laughs> um, I love Lex Luthor so much. That has almost nothing to do with what this message is about. What more importantly, it has to do with the person I go with to these rides. It has to do with. The past three times in this one year, he asked me to go with him. And I said, yeah, I'll go. Totally. I'd love to go. And every time he asked me a week before, I would say, I can't go anymore. For whatever reason, financial, I have different priorities, I can't go. And it started becoming a habit. And I kid you not, this past Thanksgiving break we had, he asked me again. And this past weekend is when I had him come over so I could tell him. And I started feeling like a flake. I don't think any of us like our friends who are flakes, they say they'll do something and never do. And that's what I started feeling like to him. And so I'm dreading the whole time I'm sitting there, he finally arrives with our Taco Bell for lunch. We love Taco Bell so much. And we start eating, and then I bring it up. I tell him I can't go with you anymore. I wish I could, but I can't. And I'm sitting there waiting and waiting for his, his reply, see what he would say. And he says, bummer man, really looking forward to you coming and hanging out this time because you haven't and now you can't you're going to be missing out and i felt really bad i was like gosh dang it when i think about someone betraying someone else i really think about the parable that jesus says in matthew chapter 10 
verses 14 to 30. And I won't read the whole thing. I'll read bits and pieces of it. The beginning of it. I'm sorry, not chapter 10. It was chapter 25. Sorry, correction. Chapter 25. The beginning, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it into proportion of their abilities, and then he left on his trip. While he's gone, we know that the man who got five bags of silver doubled it. The man who got two bags of silver doubled it. And the man with one bag of silver, he was full of fear, so he buried it. And he waited till his master's return. And we know that in verse 27, after the master returns, and after the servants tell their master, the first two servants, mind you, tell them what they've done, they doubled what he's given them. He congratulates them, says, let's have a party, this is totally awesome. The third one says, I buried it, and he says, why'd you do that? You could have just gave it to the bank and got some interest on it and helped me get more money that way. What's really funny about that is, hang on, let's back up. Just forget what I just said. Um, when, after reading that part, when we hear about this parable, a lot of the time we hear from the perspective of us, of how God has given us something, and what are we going to do about it? And are we going to trust him that he'll give us what we can handle? Are we going to trust him to come back after his um, journey away? And uh, give us the right spiritual gifts. I know a lot of us think of this as spiritual gifts that he gives us, but uh, what if someone guesses their spiritual gift? I heard someone talk about them having a spiritual gift assassins. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> really interesting. They didn't like it. And when we ask those questions, we automatically say, yes, we trust God that he will do this and that he's given us our spiritual gifts. But what about the other side, where he trusts us? Put yourself in the perspective of Jesus. Put yourself in the master's shoes. When he tells that third servant that that servant should have put the money in the bank, couldn't he have done that at the beginning before he left and given the money to his servants? He could have put all his money in the bank and made interest off of it. But he doesn't. He gives it to his servants. Why? He actively chose to trust them with it. Here's my point. So much of our thoughts are about trusting in God. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. The Psalms and Proverbs are full of that to the brim of why we should trust God. And we really need to. Think about the other side as well. God trusting in us. You think about the Israelites. He, trust, he chose to trust in them. And we know that they went on to doing a better job of running the Sin Cycle Marathon. Doing that over and over and over again. What about someone else? Let's look at Exodus chapter 3 and half of chapter 4, the first half of it. I won't read it. But that's the story of Moses and the burning bush. And we know that Moses sees the burning bush. He runs to it. What the heck is this thing? It's burning, but it's not burning kind of deal. And hear the voice and so on and so forth. Then God explains to Moses his plan of why he wants to use Moses. Do you guys know how many times Moses protested against this plan? How many times God would say, do this for me, and he would say, I can't do this for you for his own reasons? He didn't do it once, he didn't do it twice, he didn't do it three times, he didn't do it four times, he did it five times. He told God, I can't do this five times. And clearly we can see from that that Moses didn't trust himself. And in a way, showed that he didn't trust God and how God trusted in him. God was using divine persuasion to show Moses that God himself trusted in him. And divine persuasion is an interesting word, I think, because persuasion sometimes has a negative kind of thing to it. But divine persuasion is actually opposite. I get this definition from Strong's Concordance. And this is what he says. Faith is always a gift from God and never something that can be produced by people. In short, faith for the believer is God's divine persuasion and therefore distinct from human belief yet involving it. The Lord continuously births faith into the yielded believer so that they can know what he prefers. The persuasion of his will. That's what faith is. 
And First John chapter 5 through 4 sheds a little light on exactly what this does for us. Chapter 5 verse 4 in First John, it says, For every child of God defeats this world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. What is our faith? Where does it come from? It comes from Him. What is it? It's His will being put into us, His divine persuasion in us. And you can think of many other stories in the Bible where God chooses to trust people. You can think of Jonah and what did he do? He actually denied it and went the other way. You can think of Joseph. You can think of David. You can even think of Paul and Jesus, our greatest example. But when someone denies his will, maybe because out of fear, like we see in the parable of the three servants, that servant totally misses out on something awesome and great and joyous. And it's kind of like how when I told my buddy I could no longer go with him, I can no longer go enjoy that thing I want to go do with him. And when we begin to see that God is choosing to trust in us and do his thing and we say yes to it, we'll experience a lot of joy out of this. And even better than that, we'll experience so much peace. And he will take you to places, if you say yes and you recognize it, he'll take you to places you've never been. And you'll see things from a different perspective, a different altitude. You'll no longer see things from how you see them, but you'll see things from how he sees them. And that will bring a lot of terror sometimes, <laughs> joy, and memorable things. So uh, my question for you is, do you believe that God actually trusts in you? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Yes, there are. Uh, they're right here. 